Father in heaven, we do realize the Bible is very clear that we are caught in the middle of a battle between good and evil. And the good news is we know how it ends. And we know that uh, you have already assured, you are assured of the victory. And if we are in you and you are in us, then we are assured of victory as well. I ask for your Holy Spirit's leading as we look at what the Bible says about the great controversy and why it matters to us today. We pray for your guidance in Jesus' name. Amen. So in Matthew chapter 13, Jesus tells one of his many parables about the kingdom of heaven. I'd like to start there this morning as we look at what the Bible says about the great controversy and why it matters to us. Now, the words great controversy, at least as a phrase, those are, of course, not found in the Bible itself. But the idea of a, a fight, a contest between good and bad, between uh, righteousness and unrighteousness, between God and Satan, very clearly runs throughout the entire Bible. But this parable that Jesus tells in Matthew chapter 13 summarizes it in a very graphic way for us. So Matthew 13, beginning in verse 24. Another parable put he forth unto them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is likened unto a man which sowed good seed in his field. The good man, of course, represents God, right? And everything God does is good, it's perfect, and so the good seed represents the good work God did in creating this world. But, verse 25, while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his, his way. So here we see the devil introduced into the parable. He is the one who is responsible for all of the evil, all of the suffering, all of the sin that we are dealing with. Verse 26, but when the blade was sprung up and brought forth fruit, then appeared the tares also. If you've ever planted a garden, you know that you don't get fruit the next day, right? Wouldn't that be wonderful if it worked out that way? In fact, you don't even see the sprouts coming up out of the ground for Five, six, ten, fourteen days, depending on what kind of seed it is. I planted some melon seeds uh, about five days ago, and every morning I'm going to check, and they're not there yet. And I'm hoping when I get home from church, I'll see the dirt popping up there. Okay? So Jesus is right in how it works. Now, verse 27. So the servants of the household came, or the householder came and said unto him, Sir, didst not thou sow good seed in thy field? From whence then hath it tares? And isn't that the big question in the world uh, for people? If God is good, then why do we have a sinful, evil world? And it's a good question. And the great controversy explains why that situation is, but more importantly, it explains how it's going to end. And uh, we can be thankful for that. So verse 28, he said unto them, an enemy has done this. The servant said unto him, wilt thou then that we go and gather them up? Wouldn't it have been nice if God had dealt with sin and Satan immediately, right there, right? Sin would have never left heaven. Lucifer would have just ceased to exist. And uh, we'd be enjoying a much different kind of life right now, right? In God's wisdom, he knew that would not be the best way to deal with this thing called sin. So, verse 29. But he said, Nay, lest while they gather up the tares, ye root up also the wheat with them. You know, if God had just snapped his fingers or flicked his finger like that and Lucifer was thrown out of existence, there would be good angels and maybe good beings from whatever other worlds might exist that would have followed Lucifer because, boy, if that's how God responds when he's challenged, then maybe this, this angel was right, right? That's what Jesus is saying here in verse 29. We don't want to lose the good with the evil. So verse 30 let them both grow together until the harvest. And in the time of harvest, I will say to the reapers, gather ye together first the tares and bind them in bundles to burn them, but gather the wheat into my barn. Just like a, a garden or any kind of plant growing, it has to come to maturity, right? That fruit appears near the end of the life cycle if it's an annual plant, right? You wait for weeks or months as that plant grows bigger and bigger and the leaves develop and the roots get stronger. And then finally, right at the end, the fruit comes. And then if it's like a tomato plant, you pick some fruit off of it and not long after, that's it for the plant, it's over. This is what Jesus is explaining in this great controversy. 
right, which has been going on now for a long, long time. Good and evil have to come to maturity, and God cannot wipe sin out of existence until that point comes, when good and evil have both come to maturity. Now notice what Jesus says at the end of verse 30, in the last phrase or two there. He says, gather together first the tares and bind them in bundles to burn them, but gather the wheat into my barn. At the end of the harvest, there were two kinds of plants, right? Not three, not four, not five, only two kinds. There was the good and the evil. And so the Bible tells us that at the end, when uh, sin and righteousness have come to maturity, there will only be two groups of people, right? Those that value God's righteousness and want that for their lives, and those that reject it and seek something else. Only two groups of people. Now, I'm going to play a video clip for you in just a second here. This is Tucker Carlson. He's being interviewed by Joe Rogan. Now, obviously two pretty well-known people in our country here. A lot of people listen to them and watch them. Um, I'm not playing this clip because they're theologians. I'm playing the clip because they're not theologians. But they're going to be discussing, this was a three-hour or so conversation a a few weeks ago, and uh, I've just got a few seconds. But they're discussing, among many other things, good and evil. And as they look at the world, and our culture especially, you're going to hear them talking about their response to it, and then we'll, we'll discuss what they've said after this. So I'm going to hold this microphone up here. Like, there are a lot of people who seem to be just, like, for evil for its own sake. And you're like, maybe all the, like, crazy talk about a spiritual war of, like, good and evil, maybe there's something to that. Maybe that's not an illusion. Maybe that's, like, everyone else has always thought that. Maybe. There are certainly forces that have evil consequences. Maybe there is like a supernatural realm. Maybe there's more than just like what we can see and feel. Maybe life is more than just ordering it on Amazon. Maybe there's like a purpose. Maybe there is this battle between good and evil. And why is it so obvious to a completely, even a completely secular person like me all of a sudden? And I said, if I was Satan, if Satan was real, I would do that. Exactly. If I was, if Satan's real, I would, I mean, if Satan was going to do something insidious and, and unbelievably creepy, he would do that. So here's two guys. They're just looking at what's going on in our world right now. And, you know, I think Tucker claims to be, believe in God at, at some level here. I don't know about Joe Rogan, but they don't claim to be, you know, they're not trying to be uh, expositors of the word of God here, but they are saying there's something to this, Right. There is no other way to explain what is happening in our world, in our culture, other than the fact that there is something called evil and there must be a fight between good and evil. So let's go to our uh, questions here. Number one, what kind of battle does the Bible say that we are in? And we're going to go to Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through 12. Ephesians chapter 6, 10 through 12. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Now, that last phrase there, in high places, Paul writes elsewhere about the high places where the battle is fought. This is in 2 Corinthians uh, 10, verses 3 to 5. And he makes it very clear that, that at least as he sees it, the high place refers to our mind, right? And we know that there's always been a battle in the mind. This is where it started in heaven, when Lucifer began his lies and deceptions about God. And before there was physical fighting in heaven and Satan was cast out, there was the information warfare, the propaganda that took place. And certainly that has continued uh, throughout the thousands of years since we've been dealing with sin here in this world. But if we take Jesus' parable, right, about good and evil coming to maturity right at the end, then we should expect that this battle, which has always existed in the mind, largely invisible, at some point is going to spill out. It's going to become so mature that it's going to become more and more blatantly apparent in the world around us. And I think that's what Joe Rogan and Tucker Carlson are recognizing, right? 
things are coming to maturity. So question number two, where did this battle begin? Now we're going to go to our scripture for today, Revelation chapter 12. We're going to spend the rest of our study time going through these verses that we read in our scripture reading. So Revelation chapter 12, verses 7 and 8. Where did this battle begin? And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought and his angels and prevailed not. Neither was their place found any more in heaven. Okay, so the Bible does tell us more about uh, the origin of this dragon or Satan himself, right? And we're going to look at one of those passages in Ezekiel chapter 28. So in Ezekiel 28 verses 14 and 15, we get a snapshot. We see a picture of the devil before he was the devil, right? He's a created being. He has not existed from eternity like God. And so he must have... Well, he did have a beginning, and God intended, of course, for this angel to serve a holy and noble purpose in the government of God. And we get a snapshot of that in this passage here. Thou art the anointed cherub that does what? That covereth. And we'll come back to that in just a moment. You are the anointed cherub that covereth, and I have set thee so. This is God speaking. So God had a definite purpose and plan for this angel's life. And that, that phrase, I have set thee so, that, that reflects that, right? We use different words to describe how we will place things. Uh, if it's a piece of trash, we usually say, do we say go set the trash away or do we say go throw out the trash, right? When you're throwing something, you don't care where it lands or how it lands as long as it's out, right? Now, when we take something that we respect and care about, let's say the Bible, for instance, we don't say go throw the Bible somewhere, we will set it down in a, in a specific place. That's what the Bible's telling us about God's plans for this angel. Um, he was the anointed cherub, and God designed that he be right there. Now let's keep reading. You are upon the holy mountain of God. Thou hast walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. Thou wast perfect in thy ways from the day that thou wast created until iniquity was found in you. Very important, right? The Bible is absolutely clear that sin or iniquity was not put into the devil by God. Some worldviews see God as good and evil at the same time, right? This duality. You've seen the Chinese yin and yang symbol, right? That's this idea that whatever this power is that's ultimate power, it has both good and evil, uh, light and dark sides. That's not what the Bible says. So wherever sin came from, it is not God's fault. It was found in the heart of this angel that had been created to stand in God's presence as an anointing cherub. Now, when God told the Israelites and Moses to build the sanctuary there in the wilderness, he gave very detailed instructions, didn't he, about how they were to do that. And that included the Ark of the Covenant in the most holy place. And we'll get an insight into where uh, Lucifer, the angel, was in heaven by looking at the model here on earth. So Exodus 25, verses 21 and 22. Thou shalt put the mercy seat above upon the ark, and in the ark thou shalt put the testimony that I shall give thee. Now, that's the Ten Commandments. Inside the Ark of the Covenant, the two tables of stone that God wrote on with his own fingers, he told Moses, put those inside the Ark of the Covenant. And then frequently, in the King James, at least, it's referred to as the testimony or the tables of the covenant. Now, reading on. And there I will meet with thee, and I will commune with thee from above the mercy seat, from between the two cherubims. So we've got the illustration here, doing our best to represent the glory of God, right? Shining from between the two cherubims. Two very important things that were Around the throne of God, which is represented by the Ark of the Covenant here, you have the law of God, foundation of his government, and then you have the glory of God shining out from between the cherubs. Now, Moses and the Israelites built the model that was, you know, several feet wide and so forth, and you had golden cherubs hammered out of pure gold. And one of those represents the position that this angel Lucifer had in heaven, right? God set him there. For a specific purpose. Now, what does this tell us about what God was wanting for Lucifer? Well, at least two things. 
God's law serves as the diagnosis of sin. The Apostle Paul, writing in Romans 7, 7, makes it clear that we would not know what sin is unless there was a law that told us this is wrong. So he says in that verse, what shall we say then? Is the law sin? God forbid. I had not known sin, but by the law, for I had not known lust, except the law had said, thou shalt not covet. So the law is the diagnosis of sin. Not only does it reflect God's character, but it warns us when our character is out of harmony with his character. And if we're out of harmony with God's character, that's called sin. And so this is an important purpose of the law. Now, what about the light that was shining from between the cherubim? Well, that was the glory of God. And uh, there are many verses. This is one of them, Psalm 97, verse 6, that tells us that God's glory is his righteousness, right? The heavens declare his righteousness, and all the people shall see his glory. Now, righteousness is simply right doing, right? It's, it's the result of a character. So a good character will do what's right, and that's righteousness. A bad character will do what's wrong, that's unrighteousness. God's character is perfect. He always does what is right. So his character is righteous, and it's reflected in the, uh, the principles of the Ten Commandments there. Now, why did God place this particular angel in that spot? I would suggest to you that God knew from the beginning, right, because he knows all things, that this angel named Lucifer, who was created perfect, was going to be the one angel in all of creation that would suffer with this, these temptations called sin, right? We don't know what the time gap was between his creation and, and when sin erupted in his heart. But God, of course, knew that it would happen eventually. And rather than sequestering this angel off to the far corner of the universe where he wouldn't do any harm. God instead sets him right next to his throne. In the one place, in the one job in the entire universe where he would stare day and night into the diagnosis of sin, that's the law, and the cure for sin, which is the righteousness of Christ. And God did that because he's love, right? Now, Lucifer, the name means light bearer. Was it his own light that was shining? Of course not. He's a created being. Any light or glory that he might have is just a reflection of his creator. Same with us, right? So these are two interesting statements here from Spirit of Prophecy. The first one, Experiences in Australia, page 150. Now, Adam and Eve, after they had transgressed, saw that they were naked, the garment that had covered them and represented the righteousness of Christ departed when they sinned. We looked at this last week when we were uh, studying the nature of man, right? Adam and Eve uh, didn't have any textiles on, but they did have the robe of light. And so that robe of light represents the righteousness of Christ. Now look at the second statement, and it tells us that the angels have the same robe on. The sinless pair wore no artificial garments. They were clothed with a covering of light and glory, such as the angels wear. So long as they lived in obedience to God, this robe of light continued to enshroud them. That's Patriarchs and Prophets, page 45. So what's the point? Lucifer, the light bearer, was merely reflecting God's light, his glory, his righteousness. And he and all the angels that God created had the same robe of light on that Adam and Eve had when they were created, the righteousness of Christ. Law of God, righteousness of Christ. This is what Lucifer rebelled against in heaven when he finally turned his back on God and open war you know, uh, resulted. Lucifer had turned his back on two primary things, the law of God and the righteousness of Christ. And if we want to understand what the real foundational issues are in the great controversy, it's those two things, the law of God and the righteousness of Christ. Now, when Lucifer turned his back, this was the close of his probation. Very powerful statement here from Desire of Ages, page 761. Lucifer in heaven had sinned in the light of God's glory. Literally, he stood right there, right? To him, as to no other created being, was given a revelation of God's love. Understanding the character of God, knowing his goodness, Satan chose to follow his own selfish, independent will, and this choice was final. 
There was no more that God could do to save him. But when man was deceived, his mind was darkened by Satan's sophistry. The height and depth of the love of God he did not know. For him there was hope and a knowledge of God's love. By beholding his character, he might be drawn back to God. Now you know one of the many reasons why God did not immediately snap his fingers and blot Lucifer out of existence, right? Because there are questions, there is deception that has been thrown out there in the universe and in the world because of sin, because of Satan's lies. And God is trying to pull each of us back to him, and that takes time. Things have to come to maturity, both good and evil, before God can say, it is finished, it is done. All right, next question. Where did the battle between God and Satan move next? So we just read in Revelation 12, 7 and 8 that there was war in heaven and Satan lost that war and so he and his angels are cast out, but where were they cast out to? Let's keep reading, verses 9 and 10, Revelation 12. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, Bad news for us, right? And his angels were cast out with him. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now is come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. Good news if you're a heaven dweller, right? That was good news for the rest of the angels. This guy was out of here, along with all the other fallen angels. Bad news if you're an earth dweller. Because now the center of the controversy, the center of the battle, and the focus of deceptions, now it's here on earth. And this is where we find ourselves, right? Caught in the midst of this. And it's becoming so intense that even a completely secular-minded person, if they're honest, as they look at what's going on, they have to admit there is something to this thing called good and evil, right? The world is headed somewhere fast. So uh, take your Bible. We're going to flip through a few verses here as we we look at a few other verses that explain what's going on. Now, Exodus 15. Let's go there first. Exodus chapter 15. This is part of the Song of Moses right after God has delivered the Israelites from the Egyptian army in the Red Sea. And so Moses, this is part of his song here, song of praise and gratitude. We're going to look at Exodus 15 beginning at verse 13 first. We're going to see that God's throne and his sanctuary in heaven, this is his habitation. It's where he dwells. Okay, verse 13. Thou in thy mercy hast led forth the people which thou hast redeemed. Thou hast guided them in the strength unto thy holy habitation. Okay, so God is leading the Israelites out of bondage, out of slavery. He's taking them to his habitation. Now, where is that? Jump down to verse 16. Fear and dread shall fall upon them. By the greatness of thine arm, they shall be as still as a stone until thy people pass over, O Lord, till the people pass over which thou hast purchased. So they're going to pass over from wherever they've been into God's habitation. Now look at verse 17. Thou shalt bring them in and plant them in the mountain of thine inheritance, in the place, O Lord, which thou hast made for thee to dwell in the what? In the sanctuary, O Lord, which thy hands have established. Psalm 99 verse 1 tells us that God dwells between the cherubim, right? There is a temple in heaven. There is a sanctuary in heaven. It is the throne room of God. It's the control center of the universe, right? The source, center of power for the entire universe. Now, go to Jude 6. This is a little book right before the book of Revelation. So God's habitation is there beside his throne. This was Lucifer's habitation for a long time until sin was found in him. But look at what Jude tells us. There's only one chapter. If you flip too fast, you're going to go right past the whole book. Jude, verse 6, tells us, The angels which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation, he hath reserved in everlasting chains under darkness, under the judgment of the great day. This is talking about the fallen angels that are cast out of heaven. They are now bound here on earth. They're not free to just fly wherever they want and annoy the rest of creation. So they're they're bound here and chained, so to speak, under the judgment of the last day. 
But what I want to focus on there is the fact that Jude 6 tells us that they left their habitation. But didn't we just see that Lucifer was beside the throne of God, which is God's habitation? So how does that work? When Lucifer turned his back on God's law and the righteousness of Christ, that was no longer his habitation. And all the angels that made the same decision as he did to reject God's law and to reject the righteousness of Christ and trust in their own supposed righteousness, they now had their own habitation in heaven, and that doesn't work, right? Because sin is a cancer, and that had to be removed from heaven. So they left their habitation because they had already left God's habitation. I hope that makes sense, right? They are no longer heaven dwellers. They were now earth dwellers and said, God, God said, you belong on earth, right? You can't be here in heaven. So they're cast out. Okay. When they rejected God's law and righteousness, they became earth dwellers. The final battle of the great controversy is between two laws, two standards of righteousness, and which one will we choose? Humanity will be divided between those that keep God's law and claim Christ's righteousness, and on the other hand, those that do not. Revelation refers to these two groups as heaven dwellers and earth dwellers. You thought I made that up, didn't you? Let's turn to Revelation again. <clears throat> Revelation chapter 12. And look at verse 12. We just read this a moment ago. Therefore rejoice, you heavens, and you that dwell in them. So there's the heaven dwellers. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea. There's the earth dwellers. We see it again in the next chapter. Look at chapter 13. <clears throat> verse, I put verse 5. It's actually verse 6, but we'll start in verse 5. Revelation 13, verse 5. And there was given unto him, this is the beast from the sea, a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies, and power was given unto him to continue for forty and two months. And he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle and them that dwell where? In heaven. So here is a power based on earth that wants nothing to do with God's law or his righteousness, right? It doesn't want anything to do with those heaven dwellers. Now jump down to verse 8. All that dwell upon the earth shall worship him. And that's not God. It's talking about this beast power, right? So all that dwell on earth, that's the earth dwellers, will worship him. They will follow, they will accept another law, they will accept another standard of righteousness. Whose names are, unless their names are written, uh, sorry, let me start again, verse 8. All that dwell upon the earth shall worship him, whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. You see two groups of people very clearly there. Earth dwellers, heaven dwellers. Now we want to be part of the heaven dwellers, right? Here's good news. You can be a heaven dweller right now, even though we're physically trapped here on earth. If you accept Christ as your source of righteousness, and if you accept God's law as the standard of your life, you are a heaven dweller. And that's good news. The bad news is that the devil's going to be really angry with you for making that choice. And he's going to try to pull you back to be an earth dweller. This is called the great controversy. This is what Joe Rogan and Tucker Carlson are looking at, right? There is a battle going on. They don't know the terminology because they're not looking at Bible prophecy, but they recognize that it's becoming more and more visible. Next question. How is the battle on earth described at the end of time? We just read this verse. Look at the last phrase, Revelation 12, verse 12. The devil knows that he has, what, a long time? Millennia more to, to work? No, it says a short time. Now, read in context, Revelation 12, verse 12, is, is really looking at after Jesus dies on the cross, most likely, right? Satan is finally barred from heaven forever. We know that in the Old Testament, he could go back to heaven because we have it in the book of Job, where, where Satan goes back as, a, as the ruler of earth, right? But when Jesus dies on the cross, Satan is unmasked before the rest of the universe. His sympathy is cut off with every other created being except for us humans, and so he is no longer allowed in heaven. And so this final casting out of heaven really takes place at the crucifixion and then the resurrection. So at that point, 2,000 years ago, the devil knows that he has but a short time. And we look at it and say, well, that's a long time. 
right? 2,000 years, and it is for us humans. But in the scope of eternity, it's just like that, isn't it? And in the scope of Lucifer's entire life, we don't know how long he's lived, but it's, it's like that. However, there are time prophecies that we have in the Bible that, that point specifically to the very end of time. We're going to look briefly. You know this one, Daniel 8, verse 14, unto 2,300 days, and then shall the sanctuary be cleansed, right? This points to the time of the end, the very last closing scenes in this great controversy here on earth, when God begins his final judgment. And out of this prophecy arose a movement. This is why we're here this morning, right? The Advent movement, as people studied these prophecies, went through a disappointment, they thought... It pointed to the return of Christ in 1844. Clearly it did not, but they continued studying. And they actually began to understand the very next morning on October 23, 1844, that uh, this prophecy really pointed to things taking place in heaven. Now you might, um, well, okay, let's do this first. The three angels' messages, we understand to be the message that this movement is given, right? The uh, last warning to the world. Fear God, give glory to Him, for the hour of His judgment has come. The second angel warns about Babylon, which has fallen. The third angel warns about the mark of the beast. And then in Revelation chapter 18, those three angels are joined by a fourth and final angel. Look at Revelation 18, verse 1. After these things, I saw another angel come down from heaven, having great power, and the earth was lightened with his glory. So here is a heaven dweller coming down to the earth dwellers to try to help the earth dwellers become heaven dwellers, right? Now, what is the message? Look at verse 4. Come out of her, my people, that ye be not partakers of her sins, and that ye receive not of her plagues. It's a call to come out and be separate, to uh, separate, to, be, to divide from what's going on in the world. Now you might be interested to know that there is another message, and I know this isn't news to you. There is another message in the world today that is the opposite of that message. It's a call for all of humanity to unite together, right? This is why it's called Babylon or mystery Babylon or spiritual Babylon in Revelation. It comes from the Tower of Babel all the way back in Genesis. And the goal of the Babel builders was to unite humanity under their power. And in fact, the name Babel, the first part of it, B-A-B, Bab, means the gate in Arabic. And L is God, so the gate of God. They were trying to build their way to heaven, right? through their own righteousness, through their own laws, on their own terms. Now, you might be interested to know that the Advent movement is not the only movement that rose out of the mid-1800s that has a message for the whole world. Some of you may have heard of the Baha'i faith. It's, um, it has connections with Islam, but it's a little bit different. In the middle of the 19th century, one of the most turbulent periods in the world's history a young merchant announced that he was the bearer of a message destined to transform the life of humanity. He took the name the Bab, meaning the gate in Arabic, right? Babel? Here it is again. Now, my focus is not so much on Baha'ism, right? Or those that, that are part of this movement. What I want to share with you is um, what the message is, because the message is not just their message. It's a message that we're hearing from everywhere in the world. We need to unite together but it's summarized very well here. So in the middle of the 19th century, that's the middle 1800s, right? Let's keep reading. This is all from their website. On a spring evening in 1844, a conversation took place between two young men that heralded a new era for the human race. A Persian merchant announced to a traveler in the city of Shiraz that he was the bearer of a divine revelation destined to transform the spiritual life of humanity. The merchant's name was uh, Sayyid Ali Muhammad, and he is known to history as the Bab, meaning the gate in Arabic. Now, why 1844? It's a good question, right? They all explain to you. This, again, is from their websites. At the time of the appointed hour in 1844, after the prescribed time allotted of the 2300 evenings and mornings had passed, the Bab arose. That's amazing, isn't it? That's amazing. Two movements 
with opposite messages, but arising at the same time, looking at the same time prophecy. Now, what exactly is the message? Here's what they say. Humanity, the Baha'i writings explain, has passed through the stage of childhood and now stands at the threshold of its collective maturity. Hmm, Jesus said something about maturity and a harvest, didn't he? The hallmark of this approaching age of maturity is the unification of the human race. So not come out and be separate. We must unite together. One more statement. The fundamental principle enunciated by Baha'u'llah is that religious truth is not absolute but relative, that all the great religions of the world are divine in origin, that their basic principles are in complete harmony, that their aims and purposes are one and the same. We're hearing this not just from this group, right? You hear it from all over. That they differ only in the non-essential aspects of their doctrines and that their missions represent successive stages in the spiritual evolution of human society. Interesting, right? So let's look for just a moment at the year 1844 because there were actually a lot of things that happened in 1844. People that doubt this prophecy in Daniel 8.14 will say nothing happened in 1844, but is that actually true? When we look at our world today, and you'll see this in just a moment very clearly, our world today is shaped by things that began in 1844. So, we just read about the evolution, so-called evolution of humanity. The evolutionary theory really got its launch in 1844. You've all heard of Charles Darwin, but uh, right before he became well-known, there was another guy named Robert Chambers, and he wrote his book in 1844 called Vestiges of the Natural History of Creation. It integrated research in the burgeoning sciences of anthropology, geology, astronomy, biology, economics, and chemistry, and it was the first attempt to connect the natural sciences to a history of creation. So he took the first step that allowed Charles Darwin to take the full leap to uh, an evolutionary worldview. Now, Charles Darwin's book, Origin of the Species, was published in 1859, but he tells in the foreword that the first draft was written in 1844. And that's uh, from a little snapshot from his preface there. All right, so evolutionary theory. We know that's a huge factor in our world today. And this mindset that we just read about, that humanity is now needing to take the next step in its evolution, that's an evolution, obviously an evolutionary mindset. You can see it also in the uh, AI and the artificial intelligence, right? And uh, we were talking about this last week as well. Um, the, uh, I'm, the word's slipping me right now. <clears throat> Transhumanism. This idea that we're going to merge with our own technology and become something greater than human. It's all an evolutionary worldview. Did you know that Samuel Morse, his first Morse code telegraph was sent in 1844? Electronic communications started in the year 1844. Now, that's not inherently a bad thing. Uh, it's a blessing, right? And it can be used for good but we know that it's also used for evil at the same time. His first message that was sent was, what hath God wrought? He quoted the Bible. If only <clears throat> the electronic communications industry had the same attitude as Samuel Morse today, right? <laughs> this world would be a lot better place. Germ theory. This is where our understanding of bacteria, viruses, germs, things like this come from. 1844. Although most of what has been written about the germ theory relates to bacteria, the first microorganisms to be associated with disease were yeast and fungi, no doubt because they are visible to the naked eye or with the aid of low magnification. Such observations can be dated from 1844, when they were first identified. That's amazing, isn't it? Has germ theory become a major player in our world today? This idea that we can... Take something smaller than you can see with your naked eye and manipulate it and encapsulate it and then do something with it, obviously. Modern spiritualism also dates to the year 1844. This guy, Andrew Jackson Davis, was kind of the, uh, the father of modern spiritualism in New England in the mid-1800s. And he was the one that promoted, you may have heard of the Fox sisters that heard rappings in their door. He was the one that really discovered them, so to speak, and promoted them and helped their story get out there. And his first 
experience was in 1844. Now, another huge influence in our world today is the sexual revolution, right? With all of its flavors and variations and manifestations. There was a woman named Margaret Fuller that lived in the mid-1800s. And uh, she is looked at even today as the godmother, so to speak, of the modern sexual movement. So this is from a website devoted to her, margaretfuller.org. No other feminist made the claim integral to an affirmation of the human race. That's your first problem right there, right, is affirming the human race in its fallen condition. What did she say? That gender was not fixed but fluid. That women could be like men and men like women. No other feminist saw the possibilities of utopian transformation so clearly and based it on such faith in the fluid potential of human and divine nature. Isn't this the same lie that Satan told Eve in the Garden of Eden? You can be like whom? You can be like God. Your nature is actually fluid. If you choose it, if you want it, you can be it. Same lie. In all these ways, she made a great difference both to her immediate feminist heirs and to us today. Now take... Just a shot in the dark. What year might she have done something significant? <laughs> yeah, so in 1843, she wrote some articles um, called Woman in the 19th Century that were very scandalous for the time, right? She was talking very frankly about sexual things. And then, well, I'll just read it here. Margaret Fuller's Woman in the 19th Century was first published in The Dial in 1843. Some of Fuller's friends were so impressed with it that they suggested she expand it and rewrite it into a full-length book. She did just that, and the book was published in 1845 under its new title. So what year was she rewriting it? 1844. Okay. One more example. You've heard about the Great Reset, right? This grand new world order that supposedly is going to just be the thing for all of us. <clears throat> I'm not saying this is the first time it's ever found in print, but it's the earliest date I've been able to find from the writings of Karl Marx. This is his book, The Holy Family, published in 1844. The revolutionary movement, which began in 1789, talking about the French Revolution, gave rise to the communist idea in France after the Revolution of 1830. This idea consistently developed is the idea of the New World Order. Okay? Now, let's just put all those up there together. Evolution, sexual revolution, modern spiritualism, germ theory, microbiology, electronic communications, the new world order. Is it just me or do you see all of these things converging on us just in the last decade? Maybe the last five years especially. It's all coming to maturity right now. What should that tell us about where we are in this world's history? What should it tell us about where we are in the great controversy? You see, Joe Rogan and Tucker Carlson are not incorrect. They are recognizing that something is changing in this world. They don't have the, the foundation and the framework to put all the pieces in place. You pray for them that they'll find that out, right? Imagine what a force for good they could be with their audience if they really started to understand and accept what the Bible says. Now, let's get back to the Bible. Revelation 16, beginning in verse 13. We get a picture of the very final stages of the great controversy. Revelation chapter 16. This is the sixth plague. I'm actually going to start in verse 12. And the sixth angel poured out his vial upon the great river Euphrates, and the water thereof was dried up that the way of the kings of the east might be prepared. Now verse 13, which is on your screen. And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. For they are the spirits of devils working miracles, which go forth to the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. Remember the parable Jesus told, right? When things come to maturity, the tares are gathered together in bundles, and the wheat is gathered together as well. So here we see the gathering of humanity as we approach the battle of Armageddon. Now, the next verse 15 is kind of interesting. Behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he that watcheth and keepeth his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. 
This is the voice of Jesus himself interrupting the vision. Right before the Battle of Armageddon, right? The final closing scenes of this earth's history, urging his people to keep their garments. Now I'll give you one guess. What garment is it that we should be keeping? The garment of Christ's righteousness. You see, you can be a heaven dweller even here on earth. If you accept God's law as the foundation of your life and Christ's righteousness as the power to keep that law. That's what the battle is about. It's verse 15 right there. It's all about God's law and his righteousness. And then it goes on to verse 16. And he gathered them together to a place called in the Hebrew tongue, Armageddon. Make no mistake about it. The final issues that people must make up their minds about in this world, in the very, very near future, deal with God's law and the righteousness of Christ. Will I accept Jesus as my personal Savior? as the only one who can pay the penalty of my sins, as the only one that can provide the power to live a life that pleases God. Is God's law the rule of my life? Those are the two issues. And if you don't believe me, I don't know if I can say believe this guy, but listen to what he says, right? When Pope Francis was speaking in front of Congress nine years ago now in 2015, he said, we must be especially attentive to every type of fundamentalism whether religious or of any other kind. Now, he said this when the war on terror was still really in front of people's minds. So we think of people that blow themselves up in marketplaces, right? Religious fundamentalists. But if you ask the Catholic Church what their definition of a fundamentalist is, it has nothing to do with a wild-eyed, robed-up, crazy person with a bomb strapped around their belly. Here's what they say. And this is an official statement from them, Catholic Answers or Catholic.com. The belief that is first and foremost the defining characteristic of fundamentalists is number one, their reliance on the Bible to the complete exclusion of any authority exercised by the church. And the second is their insistence on a faith in Christ as one's personal Savior and Lord. Those are the two issues in the great controversy, aren't they? The Word of God, the law of God and faith in Jesus and his righteousness. So the battle hasn't changed. It's the same issues that caused Lucifer to get kicked out of heaven. Here's what we're told in Testimonies for the Church, volume 6, page 19. The message of Christ's righteousness is to sound from one end of the earth to the other to prepare the way of the Lord. This is the glory of God which closes the work of the third angel. Praise the Lord for that promise, right? What three things enable us to overcome in this great controversy battle? We're going to go back to Revelation 12, verse 11 now. We'll see three things. There in verse 11, what will help you overcome? And they overcame him, that is the devil, by the blood of the Lamb, by the word of their testimony, and they loved not their lives unto the death. Those are pretty simple, right? They overcame him by the blood of the Lamb. You've got to trust in Jesus. Accept him as your Savior. Give your life to him. And ask for his blood to cleanse us from all unrighteousness, right? 1 John 1 verse 7 says that his blood cleanses us from all sin. So it's not just forgiveness for things that are past. It's power to live a life that pleases God in the future. And by the word of their own testimony, your own experience with God, what has he done in your life? And they love not their lives unto the death. Are you willing to obey no matter what the consequences? I want to take that middle phrase, the word of their testimony. In Revelation 12, verse 17, we read this. The dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God and have whose testimony? testimony of Jesus Christ, but in verse 11, it says the word of their own testimony. So what does that mean? It means that Jesus' testimony must become your testimony, must become my testimony as well. If you actually look at the Greek word that's translated as have, so they have the testimony of Jesus, it doesn't just mean to have it in some real general sense, like, oh yeah, I have that at home. The actual Greek word is echo. You know what that word is. 
right? It's the same thing reflected off of something else. So to have the testimony of Jesus means that his testimony is being echoed in our lives. If someone looks at how you're living or talking or, or living your life, it's a reflection of how Jesus lived. That's what it means to have the word of their testimony. It's the same testimony of Jesus. It's his righteousness played out in your life. So what was Jesus Christ's testimony about himself when he was on earth? Turn with me to John chapter 14 and let's quickly look at what Jesus said about himself this is right before he dies. He's giving his testimony to his disciples, explaining how he lived his life here on earth. However Jesus did it should be our goal in how we do it. So what was Jesus Christ's testimony? John 14, he starts in verse 25. These things have I spoken unto you, being yet present with you. Now verse 26, first thing here. But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance, whatsoever I have said unto you. Did Jesus rely on his own power as he lived his life here on earth? Well, it's very clear. The Bible says that he was full of the Holy Spirit, Luke 4, verse 1, I believe. And Jesus said more than once, I don't go anywhere, I don't do anything, I don't say anything except as the Father gives me commandment. So Jesus is living his life under the power of the Holy Spirit. Is that possible for us? We're told it is, aren't we? What did Jesus say next in verse 27? He says, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you. Not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. You know, Jesus lived his life in peace and in freedom from fear. Pretty important, isn't it? He could sleep in the back of a little boat in the middle of a storm. And he could wake up and raise his hand and speak the word and the storm is gone. We may not be able to calm the physical elements like that, although we could if God wants to work that through us. But we are promised that whatever storm your life may pass through, if you trust in God's word and the righteousness of Christ, you can have that peace inside. So we're promised the same thing. How about verse 28? You have heard how I said unto you, I go away and come again unto you. If you loved me, you would rejoice because I said, I go unto the Father, for my Father is greater than I. Jesus lived his entire life for the glory of the Heavenly Father. Can we do the same thing? We have to do the same thing, don't we? If we want to be a heaven dweller because that's how heaven dwellers live. Verse 29, And now I have told you before it come to pass, that when it is come to pass, you might believe. You know, Jesus had told his disciples more than once what was going to happen when they got to Jerusalem. They didn't get it till afterwards. Jesus believed in prophecy, and he ordered his life to fulfill prophecy. Now, should we be trying to do the same thing? Should, shouldn't we? That's part of his testimony. How about verse 30? Hereafter I will not talk much with you, for the prince of this world cometh, and he has how much? Nothing in me. There was nothing in Jesus that would respond to Satan's temptations. And we know that Jesus was tempted in every point, like as we were, because the book of Hebrews tells us that. But there was nothing in Jesus. He chose not to respond, and he was able to not respond because he was filled with the Holy Spirit. Are we given the same promise that that can actually be possible for us as well? We are. It's called the righteousness of Christ. So no foothold for Satan in the mind and no response to temptation. What about verse 31? Jesus says, But that the world may know that I love the Father, and as the Father gave me commandment, even so I do. Arise and let us go. A lot of times people will quote from John 17 where Jesus prays for visible unity among his disciples and he says that the world may know that, that uh, you're my disciples. That is one sign, but Jesus gives another sign here that we are truly disciples of God. He says that we obey his commandments. Jesus lived his life of obedience all the way to the end and we are called to do the same thing. Jesus said, if you want to follow me, take up your cross and follow me. So Christ's testimony must become my testimony. It must become your testimony if we are to be heaven dwellers. 
What is God's promise to those who overcome? Revelation 3, verse 21. To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and am set down with my Father in his throne. We didn't look at this verse in Isaiah chapter 14 today, but the great controversy started in heaven when Lucifer wanted to exalt his throne above the, the throne of God. But you are given the promise that if you keep the word of God and you trust in Jesus and his righteousness, you will sit on a throne with God in heaven. You will get what Lucifer wanted. And you'll sit there forever with Jesus. That's beautiful, isn't it? That's amazing. Here is our calling. This is Councils to the Church, page 345. Just before us is the closing struggle of the great controversy. When with all power and signs and lying wonders and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness, Satan is to work to misrepresent the character of God that he may seduce, if it were possible, even the elect. If there was ever a people in need of constantly increasing light from heaven, if it, it is the people that in this time of peril God has called to be the depositaries of his holy law and to vindicate his character before the world. There it is, those two things once again, right? The law of God and the character of Jesus, his righteousness. This is what you and I are to represent to the world. If we were to be part of his church, if we were to be heaven dwellers here on earth, we must be doing these two things. Those to whom has been committed a trust so sacred must be spiritualized, elevated, vitalized by the truths they profess to believe. It's good to, good to speak it. Good to claim it. It's even better to live it. And God has promised that with his power, he can help us live it, no matter what storm we're going through. We know the storm is going to get more intense between here and when Jesus appears in the sky. But he has promised that he will help you ride through that storm and actually be part of the vindication of his law and his character. Is that your, your desire this morning? If it is, let's stand together as we sing our closing hymn together.